cool. Um, yeah, thank you all for yeah coming, and it's an exciting week. And hopefully, yeah, you all have uh, or had having a good week so far. I am here in C uh, based in Seattle, Washington. So local time is five thirty p.m. on Friday. Um, Yula Hawa. So I am one of the endangered languages um, language mentor. Um, so my background is I come from the uh, Himalayas, so I am Tibetan. I speak one of the endangered languages there. I did my undergrad in Oregon uh, in linguistics, and now I am doing my master's degree here in Washington in computational linguistics. And uh, yeah, as you probably all know, uh, ELP has um, uh, free mentorship programs. So feel free to schedule a meeting with one of our mentors. We have four mentors, including myself. Um, so Anna is dropping the link. Thank you. Um, so yeah, if you want to talk about your language work or anything, um, we're here to listen and help and point you to different resources that might be helpful. Um, so it's a really great um, program and resource um, at ELP. So without further ado, um, I know a lot of you are signing in and uh, uh, remotely. So I encourage you to maybe bring a pen and paper if that's handy, because we will do some jotting down words and brainstorming. Uh, so I think it's always helpful for me at least to have pen and pencil handy. So hopefully that um, I can give you 10, 20 seconds to grab a pen and pencil um, and a notebook. So yeah. So without further ado, today's topic is uh, phonetics, phonology and orthography. Um, so first, let's clear out what these terms mean. So I think um, one biggest confusion is a lot of kind of people mix up phonetics and phonology, which is which makes sense. So these are two um, subfield in the linguistics, both deal with uh, speech sounds. Um, so phonetics is um, the one who deals with physical property of speech sound. So how sound um, is produced, how it's transmitted, and how it's perceived by humans. So it's more kind of almost scientific and uh, um, there's spectrogram readings and it's a kind of insane field in my opinion. <laughs> and then phonology deals with the organization of speech sounds. So we understand these sounds and then we say, okay, are there any patterns, are there any, any rules that govern these sounds in a particular language? So phonetics deals with kind of um, universal sounds and then uh, phonology is looking at a particular language and see what rules and what systems are there. So. Now that we have uh, the definitions out of the way, <laughs> uh, let's just uh, briefly focus on what um, we are hoping to achieve in this webinar, as well as kind of larger in the uh, field of phonetics and phonology is trying to achieve. Um, so especially in the context of language documentation, uh, understanding phonetics and phonology will really help us to uh, decipher the sounds in human language and also describe what sounds are in a, uh, in a particular language or in human language and understanding and describing and then you build upon that and uh, writing these sounds out, developing an orthography, for example. So these are kind of the overarching big goals uh, for this course, or I, I'm not sure this is a very brief introduction. So uh, hopefully I can touch upon uh, some of the points. This is uh, definitely one of uh, my favorite subject when I studied linguistics. 
where I felt like I was looking at my own language in a way that is that I would never do as a native speaker. So you understand, oh, wow, this is so cool that my language has five consonant clusters in a row. And my professor, they were also jaw dropping. So I was like, whoa, this is so cool. So it's a good way to understand um, what your language does at a very fine uh, level. So in the sound of human languages, there are at least 225 sounds, uh, consonant sounds, and then 39 simple vowels. Uh, vowels are kind of the core of uh, sounds. We have to have a vowel. Still, it's kind of debatable, but vowels are essential for, uh, for language. And then dozen of diphthongs. Diphthongs are just um, two vowels, one vowel kind of bleeding in. Like, so for example, I is a uh, and e, kind of I. So moving, these are also called moving vowels. And then we can combine this in particular language in any way that this language permits. So there's nearly endless uh, combination of sounds in human language. And then we organize these sounds in two kind of big categories. So you probably <laughs> recalling a lot of your, I don't know, kindergarten alphabet. Uh, um, lessons. So we have consonants and we have vowels. So what are these? So consonants are sounds that when you produce, when you uh, utter the sounds, there's some constriction happening. So there's some stopping, whether that's from your lips, from your teeth, from your tongue, there's some stopping of that airflow. So those are called consonants. And then we have the vowel sounds. Vowel sounds are more kind of not very gated, but they are shaped uh, by your um, mouth shape and you your tongue uh, height, kind of like a, a very... Um, broad definition of consonant and vowels. Okay, um, as I was alluding, we will have a lot of opportunity to jot down things. So uh, next, I would like to invite you to list as many consonant as, uh, and vowels you can. It, it can be in English, it can be a language that you know. So you can kind of start thinking about in terms of language, in terms of sounds and letters. So I will give maybe 30 seconds for people to jot down some consonants and vowels um, that you can think of in a particular language that you know. hope uh, it wasn't too be like too difficult of an exercise. I think these are just uh, things that we learn when we start re start learning to read and write. So here is um, some examples of uh, sounds in the English. Um, so we have count uh, the consonant sounds like p in pi, b in by, and m. That's a nasal sound that in my and so on and so forth. I won't pronounce all of them, but the bolded one are the consonants on the left side. And then we have the vowels and English has actually a lot of vowels, a lot of diphthong vowels. Um, so when I was learning English, one of the hardest uh, part was distinguishing, like, for example, the first two pairs, 
bead and bid, e and it. These two sounds are pretty similar. So for me, that was like a really hard two sounds to distinguish in English. So we have e, e and e. And then a, bade, bed, a, bad, so on and so forth. So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of this is pretty, I assume it's kind of a recap because I think a lot of us know how to read and write. Um, so we kind of learn um, from, yeah, consonant and vowels. So uh, that leads us to this uh, key tool for linguists to write down languages, especially um, unwritten ones in a very unique, uh, uniformed way. It's called the IPA, not the IPA uh, that you can drink, but this is the IPA uh, short for International Phonetic Alphabet. Uh, so this is um, intention for this system is to allow us to transcribe um, human languages, human sound in a consistent way of representing the sound of a language. So there is a um, kind of a tight one to one correspondence between the sound and the symbol. So um, a good way to think about it is, is like a, um, if you're a musical, a musician or music person, um, like a mu musical notation. So that's um, once you learn it, you don't like you, everybody can kind of, it's universal in that sense. It's not language specific, but these sounds just represent uh, possible human sounds. So let's look at what this um, table looks like. You might have encountered this table before. Uh, it's kind of a intimidating table looking. Like when you first take a glance, it just seems like, oh, there's so many weird symbols and different things. Um, so let's just kind of dive into what these, how the table is structured and what these things are. So um, horizontally, we have on the very top of the table, we have the place of articulation, which basically means where the sound is generated, where the sound is articulated. And then on the uh, vertical uh, side, we have the manner of articulation, which basically means how in a particular way, how these sounds are produced. So if we look at the first one, we have on the horizontal one, we have bilabial, which just means two lips with, so when you do b and p, b, b, the, you need to use two of your lips to utter uh, those two sounds. And then plosive, it just means you're holding the air and then releasing it. Uh, so those are plosives, b, p, or b, b, uh, in this case. And then if you look at um, the other lines, it's labial dental, it's uh, lip and uh, teeth, uh, dental, and so on and so forth. It goes all the way. So it's starting from the front part of the vocal um, structure to all the way that goes to glottal, which is um, in the very back where you can um, generate a sound. So we won't go into all the each every detail, but um, in your free time, definitely feel free to explore. And there are online resources where you can click and um, listen to each sounds. And a few uh, interesting notes uh, that I want to make is you see those uh, gray bars, right? The darker gray bars. So the darker gray bars are just here to mean it's not humanly possible to um, produce those sounds. And then you also see some are kind of empty. They don't have a sound written, but there's a, a blank box so that means it's not a tested 
in any of the human languages. It's not in any of the described human languages, but these sounds are possible and could be uh, existing somewhere. Humans, we just uh, haven't explored yet. Uh, so let's just take a look at this intimidating. <laughs> I mean, I think this picture is less Im intimidating when we learned um, in our class, it was like actual, like a camera view of people's vocal fold. It was kind of scary, but this is less scary. So this is um, how the table is kind of um, structured and you can see in the first uh, diagram is the consonants. So you have lip, teeth, teeth and then you have palatal and velar and uvular that goes all the way here um, to the glottal. The, um, so that's how um, in the chart you can reference those to know where each of them are. So you kind of get a feel of when you produce these sounds, do you feel that those parts uh, getting engaged? And then the second diagram, which I haven't introduced the vowel chart, but that's the vowel um, for the vowel. So for the vowel mainly, we have this uh, diagram. So the, for the vowels, how we describe uh, vowels is from the horizontal line, we have front to back. So that's um, how the sound, sound is produced in the front, kind of front of your mouth versus back of your uh, vocal track. Um, so you can kind of have in the first line, you have E and all the way to U. So you can do a E kind of, you have, you can, I mean, all of you are kind of muted, but you can do these sounds yourself. So you kind of feel when you say E, you feel the kind of where the sound is going uh, from front to back. And then on the vertical side, we have on the top, we have clo close. And then uh, on the bottom, we have open. And what does that mean? That's the, uh, your shape of your mouth. Like, uh, is it close kind of versus is it open? So you have from E vowel to A vowel. So it's like, yeah. So you can see kind of slowly opening up. So that's how we describe. There's a lot of, you can, as you can see in the middle part, it's a very populated. So it can go very fine grain of um, analyzing which vowel it is. And um, some of the vowels gets sound really similar. So it's really hard to tell. Uh, sometimes um, in a language, if they have vowels or, uh, that are very similar. And then let's see if I forgot anything. And then we have uh, lips rounding versus lip kind of relaxed and flat. So we have in the very first row, we have E and U. So E is on the left side of the lines is the mouth flat or like just regular shape uh, lips unrounded. And then we uh, have on the red, right side of the line, we have uh, the rounded vowels. So these are kind of the phonetics of human uh, sounds where you can kind of get, you can see how <laughs> complicated and uh, how fine grain it um, can become. So let's look at some examples, how we transcribe uh, for example, these words, uh, C is S sound and E, C. So you have stick is also kind of a good thing with English is some of the um, letters are pretty similar to the international phonetic alphabet. But just imagine a language like, I don't know, Chinese, uh, where it's all character. So the phonetic transcription can be really helpful for uh, people who want to try to understand the sounds of um, Mandarin uh, without like knowing the language. Um, so like mix, 
you have mi, i, k, s. So you have four sounds, mix. Um, and then I also here dropped the um, link to where you can kind of click and listen to uh, a lot of these uh, humanly possible sounds. And some languages have really a lot of exotic sounds that I can never <laughs> produce in my, in my mouth. Uh, so you can kind of, in your free time, if, if you're that kind of nerdy person that you just like, oh, I want to listen to some human sounds, feel free to explore and uh, yeah, listen. I don't know if there's any questions. I, I haven't been monitoring the but we can kind of go if there's any question we need to address at this point. I think for now, just comments and folks sharing about their languages. Oh, wonderful. Okay, let's uh, then move on a little bit. Um, so, uh, okay, so this is also a point to uh, say that even if you may not understand the word or the language, uh, you can use IPA to transcribe it, right? So there's uh, some um, weird word. It says Gabori Sats. Gabori Sats. Sats. Um, it's a made up word, doesn't really mean anything, but. Hypothetically speaking, if this was an actual word in some language, uh, you can just go in and transcribe it. Uh, and any other linguist who understand IPA would be able to understand it. So um, this is some more examples in English. Um, so this way we can re uh, represent the sound of a language uh, really outside of the spelling system because I mean, I don't know, if, yeah, I, as an English learner at the beginning, I really complained a lot about English spelling being not very friendly to um, English learners. <laughs> Um, so uh, definitely IPA was, um, for me, was a good tool to learn um, English for sure. I mean, there's a lot of memorization that you have to do, but um, yeah. Um, so we've looked at how IPA can help us capture the exact sounds, uh, but in real life, uh, not every sound uh, difference uh, kind of changes the meaning of word. So next, we're kind of shifting gear to look at uh, phonology and explore some of the terms and some ways how we understand and analyze uh, sound patterns in a language. So we have um, this concept, these two words, uh, one is phoneme, one is allophone. I'm not sure if you heard these two words before, but phoneme basically is uh, a concept that we use in phonology to describe the smallest sound unit that can make a difference in meaning. And then allophone, uh, on the other hand, is just a variation of the sound but it wouldn't make a meaning contrast. So even if I say uh, bite and pipe, like pipe, it's still in English, you will perceive kind of more or less the same meaning. So in this example um, that uh, you see, um, stop and top, uh, in the bracketed um, brackets, you see one is transcribed as d, one is transcribed as t. So phonetically, these are two different sounds. But as you can see in that speaker's head or the English speaker, native speaker's head, these are the same sound, which is t or d, how you... Um, 
however you understand it. So the concept of um, morpheme is, um, I mean, I mean uh, phoneme is, um, where this, in this case, in English, stop and top, the T, they are allophones of the same phoneme, which is in the head T. So they are not making a meaning contrast. So we call it allophones instead of phonemes. So I will give more example um, to help us understand this as well. Uh, here also wanted to make a note about um, different ways of doing transcription. So if you want to go very, if you want to do a very detailed phonetic analysis of the language that you're um, studying or working with, you would do a phonetic transcription where you want to be writing all the details about this. For example, in the first P, um, you have the H. Uh, the upper K, upper scripted H, which is means aspirated. So aspirated is having a strong puff of air. So it's P. You can kind of hold your hold your hand in front of your lip when you say P. And do you if you feel a puff of air in uh, in your palm, that means you're making an aspirated P. Versus B, B, B. You, you're not making puff of error. That's the second uh, uh, second allophones. So in English, these three variations are allophones of the same phoneme, which is in the, the notation uh, slashes. It's for um, phonemes, phonetic transcription, and then the brackets are the detailed phonetic transcriptions. <clears throat> I'm not sure, hopefully this is a little bit complicated. So hopefully it makes sense for people. Um, so we have, if you don't understand the phoneme, hello, hello, I mean, people spend a whole semester course uh, in phonology, try to understand this. So I completely understand if it's like, oh, it's still hazy and not making any sense. But uh, for example, if we have a test called minimal pair, so this is a test to sh um, see if uh, two sounds are allophones of the same phoneme, or these two sounds are different phonemes. So this minimal pair is a diff. Um, it's two real words. It has to be real. You can't make up, and different words that only differ in one sound, and then that will allow us to see if they yeah make a meaning contrast and they have they differ in one sound. That means they're different phonemes. So in the first example, we have pot and dot. Uh, so we have p and d. So we have two different sounds. So one sound is different in each word, and then they all mean different things. So therefore, we conclude in English, p and d, they are different phones. So we need two phones um, in English, p and d. And then in the starred version where it's pot and spot, uh, these won't be um, minimal pairs uh, because as you can see, so the, it's an addition, like in the spot, we have one additional sound. So they don't have the same num num number of sound, even though it seemed kind of, when you glance at it, I was like, oh, it's a, uh, <laughs> I almost felt, even though I studied this, I was like, oh, they should be minimal pairs, right? Because they are dif they differ only in one sound, S, and they mean different things. They have different meaning, uh, but it's an addition. So it, the number of sounds are different. So they're not m minimal pairs. So we can't, make a conclusion. Um, so spot and snot also kind of same thing. Um, they're minimal pairs because P and N, they differ and they have same number of sounds and they have different meaning, so on and so forth. Uh, so 
one thing to note here is often in the uh, orthography kind of reveals if they um, are different um, phonemes versus their allophones. Um, so um, that's a good way to also make predictions. So this is kind of two example in English and Spanish. Same sound can be in depending on which language, they can be allophones of the same phoneme or they can be different uh, phonemes. So this example, I want to ask everybody in water, the, uh, the red highlighted uh, sound, water versus water. Do you think these are allophones or you think these are different phonemes? Any guesses in the chat? In water and water and water. Allophones, allophones, good. Cool. Yeah, they're allophones because they differ in sound, but there's no meaning contrast, right? So they all mean doesn't matter if I say water versus water. It's um, same meaning. So they're uh, allophones of the same phoneme. And then in Spanish, um, I actually don't speak Spanish, so I shouldn't try to <laughs> pronounce the words I might, uh, but it's, uh, uh, I don't know if it's aspirated or not aspirated. It's a pato versus paro, paro. So they are different phonemes. Uh, it's unaspirated. Oh, it's it's so it's pa, paro and pato, pato. So they uh, differ. The sound is the they are minimal pairs first of all, right? And then they differ in one sound, and they have meaning contrast. So they're um, different phonemes in uh, Spanish. And. This is also um, important note. So not all just a different sound. We want to include the tones as well, because there are a lot of languages that have tones. So if they differ in one tone, it's also minimal pair. Um, so um, classical example is uh, 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 Chinese. You have ma, 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 ma. So they all have five different tones and they all mean different things. So this is uh, not pair, but <laughs> minimal five pairs, uh, not five pairs, five, I don't know the word, but they all have different meanings. So it can, uh, for languages that have tones, it can con contrast in uh, tones as well. So now it's uh, your time again. Uh, so what minimal pairs do you think you have in your language? Write down some minimal pairs and try to see if they are allophones or they are phonemes. Um, and I will give you for this one, I will give you one minute. Um, so hopefully you have some time to think or write down or um, yeah whatever works for you. Tell you. Um. Yeah, feel free to share on, in the chat if you found any minimal pairs.
I see Farah and Fata. Not sure what each word means, but I assume, yeah, they have different meaning. So R and T are different phonemes. There's one question about minimal pair. Can we randomly select any consonants that might create a difference or should we specifically pair consonants that differ just one feature such as place of articulation or manner? And that's a great question. So minimal pair is you can select any words, any type of um, combination, sound combination. So the basic uh, requirement for minimal pair is it needs to differ in one sound. Sound can be a consonant, a vowel, or a tone. Um, these are kind of the three major um, different, uh, different uh, sounds, ca sound categories. So if as long as two words are different in consonant or vowel or tones, um, they're considered minimal pair. So you don't have to do a particular pairing if as long as, yeah, they differ in one. Wow, S seems like a lot of people found a lot of words. I will not try to pronounce them because I'm not sure if they're in IPA or some sort of orthography, so I might butcher all the sounds. <laughs> Cool, wonderful. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on to the next. Hopefully, you enjoyed this exercise. Um, so now that we have explored how changing a single sound can shift a word meaning, let uh, let's think about how we can repre represent them. Right. So I wish we can all. It's there's the linguist side of me. I wish we can all use IPA. So no more guesswork of silent letters in English. <laughs> I have some trauma, <laughs> uh, but that's a wishful thinking. As you can see, uh, these uh, IPA symbols are not very, uh, I shouldn't say human friendly, but non-linguist friendly. So these are just weird, a lot of weird symbols. Um, so they get a bit, a bit complicated. So let's uh, look at, uh, some writing systems. So in writing system, there's one big thing that we want to know here is letter doesn't respond, respond to sounds, right? So we want to make that um, big um, thing clear at the very beginning. I don't want to go into details about why letter doesn't respond to sounds because Ideally, when you create an orthography, there should be some sort of um, sound to letter correspondence. So it's easier to manage, it's uh, more um, systematic, uh, but there are a lot of historical reasons why letters don't respond to sound, borrow words, borrowed words or um, sound changes. Like if you're, if you're really interested in digging into why um, English uh, some English words are the way they are. You can kind of go into their etymology and like look through um, which language they come from and like so on and so forth. So you can kind of see and kind of make sense uh, what sound changes it went through. So I won't go into details about that, but um, as kind of I alluded, um, English letters, do not respond to sounds one on one, um, despite the um, the good reason that we want to have a one on one one on one correspondence. English has about like 40, 44 uh, phonemes, but as you can see in the chart, we only have sixty. Uh, sorry, twenty six uh, letters. So some have to do these heavy. Uh, double duty <laughs> to, uh, to represent different sounds. 
So let's see, for example, um, how many sounds can a single letter um, make? So in these cases, I have this um, letter G, letter F, and letter C, and then try to write words that has these letters and see what different sounds these letters um, produce in that particular word. So just jot down some uh, words that you can think of that has uh, G, F, C letters, can be in English or can be in any other languages also. Yes, sign, gate giraffe. Good, good. As we already mentioned, English has uh, a lot of letters that have a lot of different, um, one single, I mean letter, have a lot of different sounds. So in the uh, letter G case, we have girl, like G, and then we have giraffe, like J sound, and then we have garage, like J sound, J, J sound, garage, uh, and then we have though, so though, the, in though, the G is even G and H, they're all silent. Um, so, so going with F and C, also kind of same thing. So you really have to memorize and remember which sound um, this letter is produced in each word. Um, so that's a uh, very heavy <laughs> uh, duty for learners. And then, um, for example, this is kind of illustrating further the sound in the IPA that you have this squiggly thing. It's called, it's pronounced as sh. So you have shell, uh, chef, mission. And so these are same sound with represented in so many different letters. Um, so again, um, no letter to sound correspondence. This is a fun exercise. Try to think, uh, try to say these words backwards. So that kind of helps you to think of in terms of sounds, not in terms of letter and see what, um, words are these if you read them backwards. So the first one is shush, right? If you read from backward um, and then you have meme and then you have scab, backs is scab and then you have skates as stakes and then you have steam as meats and then you have golf as fox this is a slightly hard one uh, you can kind of go back and see if uh if that's right. And then uh, this example we, I've already shown, uh, but also kind of see how many sounds are in these words. So let's just do one uh, in the third words. A third word, mix, uh, guess how many, not guess, but try to figure out how many sounds are in mix. Yep, four sounds. So I think now people have a good intuition of sounds and letters and it's, yeah, even though there are three letters, so there's four sounds. Um, so I think that point is across and then kind of summarize a little bit of what we uh, talked about. So one sound may correspond to two or more letters and then one letter can also uh, respond to two or more sounds. So this this uh, funny um, kind of uh, 
sarcastic joke about G-H-O-T-I could be pronounced as fish. It looks nothing like fish, but all the sounds that exist in English, you can easily say, oh, G-H-O-T-I can be just pronounced as fish. <laughs> so it's a funny joke. Um, so now let's uh, look at um, the last part of our uh, presentation, so orthography. And I think um, beyond representing uh, each sound, there are a lot of sociolinguistic factors that uh, get involved when we think about orthography development. So for example, can create commu community cohesion if there's a lot of different dialectal uh, regions uh, so on and so forth. And then second one, as we know, writing system is kind of um, viewed as this prestigious thing. So um, through orthography development, some communities can kind of um, increase their um, prestigious. And then a third point is once we have the writing system, we can try to incorporate uh, into the education system, create language learning materials, so on and so forth. So these are kind of uh, clear. Um, I will skip the, for the sake of time, I will skip the type of orthography. You can kind of review, we will share the slides. Um, so these are just different types of orthography that are out there. Uh, as I mentioned, there's 200 something different type of orthography, I mean, not type, uh, different orthographies, but generally speaking, these are these three types, um, each examples. And then last kind of, but not least, I've personally did a lot of orthography development for my language. So I just wanted to kind of throw in this slide um, to give some um, like three big uh, tips that I would give if you're thinking about developing an orthography for your language. Uh, it might, I think developing orthography is a very community specific thing. So depending on your needs and your community's uh, case, it might be applicable, it might not. Um, so the first one that I felt was really helpful was um, uh, incorporating the dialectal variations at the very beginning. So I had friends who were working um, in the same language, but different dialects. So I reach out to them and say, okay, we created this kind of mega uh, orthography where we try to incorporate all the sounds that exist in all the different dialects uh, instead of just choosing one as the standard. Mm. And then the second one is having uh, so this also kind of speaks into having multiple option orthography options. Uh, so you kind of have this core uh, orthography where you want to represent your phonemes, your all your vowels. And then on top of that, if you have tones, you can add some tones. Uh, but if your community, like my case, uh, Tibetan doesn't have phone, I mean, it doesn't have tone and they don't think language in terms of tones. So it's not very intuitive for native speakers to think about tones. We also only have two tones. So I have the tone as a kind of optional. If you wanna do a very phonetic accurate transcription, you can add the tone, but the tone option, I designed it, but you don't have to have, uh, have the tone. And then the third, um, uh, tip is having a working orthography. So basically means just uh, once you kind of have like initial draft, you just throw it out there and let people use it. And then they know how to write, they know the language. So it, you can see if it's intuitive for the speakers or not. So they give you a lot of feedback. For example, initially I didn't think I was missing one phoneme and I just completely kind of forgot. So they're like, how do I write this word? And then I'm like, oh, <laughs> let me create, let me create another phoneme uh, so, uh, or a grapheme. So uh, yeah, that was really helpful. So I guess, yeah, that's the conclusion. Just uh, a few 
key takeaways, which we kind of talked about. Um, I think minimal pairs are a good way to figure out what phonemes you have in your language. So kind of you can play around and um, do some more research about your language. And then um, if orthography is your goal, uh, you can really, I think, of, as for me as a, a person with linguistic background, it's always easy to think in terms of like the phonetic accuracy. I feel like that's that should be the priority, but um, the usage part I think needs to be like really the priority and having people to test it out and see if it's intuitive and getting their feedback is really key. So sound meaning and usage, they all have to be considered. Um, Sorry, I went a little over time, um, left 10 minutes. Do I have? Yeah. Oh, it's a little. OK, I will stop now and see if uh, people have questions. I went a little over time, so yeah. Nice. Thanks, Eula. And then right. If anybody has questions, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask, or you can type them in the chat. Yeah, it's a very fast. I don't know if in yeah, the it's hard to cover a lot of things in great detail. So yeah, if you have any clarifying questions or anything that you're even thinking about, wondering uh, of your language, yeah, feel free to unmute yourself or drop a question or any, yeah. I have a question. Can you tell us about this second phrase on your slide? Uh, yes. Uh, anybody wants to try since, I mean, maybe somebody has some uh, practice in uh, international phonetic alphabet. Does anybody want to try? Give a try. Going once. Going twice. <laughs> Don't be shy. You're going to make everyone so shy. Yeah, I think IPA, you really have to, I mean, you can understand in your head one thing, but you have to like just shamelessly say a lot of like just babbling and just try to say and see if it's right. So the second phrase is in well, my we, we have a we have a volunteer. James says he oh, will try. <laughs> please, please. Okay. The um the sound that looks like an upside down R. Uh huh. I, it, I think it's going to be pronounced pretty similar to a French R, which I can't pronounce. Yes. I'm throw yes. in a different R. Yes. But that's just because I don't know how to say it right, even though it's a French <laughs> class. So I would say. Nasran net two. Ooh, that's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, you were saying, yeah, the huh. So we have a lot of uvular sounds in my language. So that's the exactly same sound as French huh. So nasron I'm, uh, I'm uh, hyper articulating, but nasron uh, It means thank you in my language. Well, well done. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, R is a difficult sound. Yeah. Nice. All right. We got some questions in the chat. Yula, would you like me to just read them out for you? Uh, sure. All right. So Daisy says, thanks for sharing your expertise in this field. Is there an available software to use for phonology? Uh, software... To use for phonology, I, I think pheno I'm not, uh, for phonology, a lot of the analysis is pretty manual. Like you have to find the patterns, right? So I'm sure there are, but I think I've never really explored. So you have to do a lot of um, data comparison. So the minimal pair is the best case, right? You, if you find a minimal pair, you can easily say, oh, okay, these are different phonemes, easy. But a lot of the times you have to just really go through a lot of data and
And in phonology classes that I took, you have to write down, okay, where does this sound occur? So you write all the environment out, but I, I'm assuming you can automate these processes as well. But a lot of the work that I did is very manual. So you write out all the environment which sound occurs and you can you try to see, okay, why is this? There's um, something called um, phonological processes. So these are sounds when um, they kind of camouflage or they kind of assimilate or dissimilate or they kind of change uh, their quality depending on the neighboring sounds. So you kind of figure, try to figure out are they these camouflaging sounds? Um, so they, are they allophones or uh, same phoneme? So there's a lot of manual uh, comparison. I don't know if Anna, if you're aware of any, um, yeah, apps yeah. or yeah. I mean, like Yula said, a lot of phonology is about looking for those underlying patterns and computers aren't very good at figuring out what's happening in the human mind. So a lot of it, yeah, is, is pen and pencil and thinking about it and looking at our recordings over and over. But if you're looking more closely at the, the sounds themselves and you want to know exactly like, oh, mm. what exactly is this vowel and how can I analyze it? Uh, that most people use a phonetic software called Prot. And I will put a link to Prot in the chat. It's pretty hard to learn to use. And we've actually had a request for a Prot training through this webinar. So we're still looking for somebody to teach that one, but stay tuned. We'll let you know if we find someone. Yeah. Yeah, as uh, I was saying, yeah, my language has a lot of consonant clusters. At, but I remember one of the phonetician in our department he was just like I don't think it's possible to say that many consonants without having some sort of vowel in between uh, so he was really like I want to do a prot analysis of you saying these consonant clusters I want to see if they're possible is there a schwa inserted somewhere is there like a like a little vowel inserted somewhere um but that never happened so i should maybe someday do that analysis um <laughs> talking about. yeah and that actually raises another question here in the chat is it necessary to incorporate any acoustic analysis to generate an accurate sound inventory mm, that's a great question and I feel like, yeah, I th the more analysis, it's uh, probably it also depend. I think it really depends on your uh, time availability, resources, your curiosity. If you're like really like, oh, I want to throw in some acoustic analysis to like really figure out even all these allophones, because I mean, sounds, human sounds, there's so much variations. Even same phoneme each time a person says it, you say in a very slightly different way. So there's so much variation that can possibly exist that it will take a lifelong to do acoustic analysis on each of them. I think at some point you just have to like, okay, these are, <laughs> I need to try to finish my, I don't know, if you're working on your dissertation, you need to like, say, okay, these are uh, it. Um, so there's a lot of external constraints that you have to think about in terms of like, just how deep of analysis you wanna go. But for, I think in the context of orthography, I think um, figuring out the basic uh, phoneme inventory is probably uh, sufficient. And, but there, as I said, there's some sounds that are really similar to each other. Uh, for example, for me, the English E and I, or some other sound, some vowels that are just really similar. And when you, especially figuring out the vowel inventory is kind of actually a hard task because the vowels can sound very similar. So some language, they are very embracing. So they, it's, uh, it's not like A, ah, O, E, U, like these very distinct sounds. They're, they have this, um, as you can, uh, you saw in the chart, some sounds in the middle, they get, get, become very similar. So you, in these cases, I think you want to do a more um, deeper analysis. Yeah. Awesome. 
And we have a very big question. What methods are effective for teaching orthography to language learners? Oh, well, that is a very big question. What a method are effective to teach orthography for language learners? Not like fluent speakers, but like a beginner language learners, I guess. Um, I think for me in my, these workshop things, um, they're all fluent speakers, but um, I think starting off something not too intimidating, I didn't approach in a very structured like, okay, these are the <laughs> consonant inventory. These are the vowel inventory. How can we combine? Like, I, I didn't do like these. I just said, think of some words that you love or like, you want to make your shopping list? Okay, let's do it. Let's sit down. And then I would just, they would just say a word. And then like, you kind of start off by like, how do I write this word? I'm going to this place tomorrow. How do I write down the name of this place? Or something that's very like relevant to them now. Uh, I think it's very engaging and very exciting. I think there was a person who reached out to me and said, oh, how do I write this word? I need to respond to this post. I want to make a comment, but I don't know how to how to write this particular word. What do you think? Uh, so kind of making it really relevant to their uh, lives. I think that for me, I found was really helping me to stay connected with the learners and then getting them motivated and excited about that. And that is everything. Like then they really can take on their own. Um, uh, yeah. Nice, that's awesome advice. Uh, we have a, a pretty interesting question. So it says, for many languages in the Himalayan belt, particularly those referred to as Zomia, most of it is nasal and sounds and vibration. So in applying IPA for those languages, is it the right tool to break down the sounds of their speech? Oh, um, I don't see that question. I don't know how I understand. Can you say it again? Yeah, so I think the question is like, some languages have really unique sounds. Is IPA a suitable tool to write down every language? Or are there some that it doesn't work for? I see. Um, as uh, I was, when I was explaining the chart, of course, as they claim, you can write any possible human languages, but as you could see, you know, there's some, white box that was not filled up. Um, so it is kind of generally kind of the ground truth of possibly existing human sounds, but that's also built upon what language we already transcribed, what language we already know. So we don't even know what we don't know. So there are sounds that could exist that's not very accurate, accurately be written in the existing IPA uh, inventories, that is really possible. Um, in those cases, you kind of, yeah, you just uh, use the sound that's kind of closest to that one um, until they make a revision. But uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah, that would be my approach, yeah. Yeah. In general, the IPA can write down pretty much any human language because for the most part, all human beings have the same speech organs. We have the same like parts of our body that make sounds. So the IPA can describe pretty much everything our mouths and throats and noses can do. Uh, we have two questions specifically about your language, Shula. Uh, one person asked, asks, why do you write the aspiration diacritic? Is it because it's contra contrastive? And someone else requested mm. if you could pronounce the thank you one more time. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. We actually have a three-week contrast. So we have the voicing contrast. We have the aspirate. So we have b, p, and b, all three um, in our language. So we have, for example, chu. We have j, ch, j, those three sounds. So we have 
all phonemes. Um, so here is nasron the chu chu. So you have j ch j. All different sounds, three way contrast. Yeah. That's so cool. Uh, we've got another question. How can we treat words that tones? Sorry, you were you cut off a little bit. How do we treat? What? Oh, sorry. Yeah, how do we treat words that have tones? And this is a very general question. I'm not quite sure what the person <laughs> wanted to know, but like maybe how do we write down tones, or how do we understand tones and phonemes and their relationships? Hmm, I see. Yeah, I mean, treat tone, especially as a native speaker, you have the intuition, like if there's a tonal contrast that you clearly know it has a different meaning. So um, in terms of just uh, noting it down, IPA, IPA has a lot of, I think there's a few different variations uh, where you can write down tones, um, diacritics, numbering, and some uh, letter uh, a representation so you can kind of choose based on your orthography and uh, see what um, way kind of can incorporate into your writing system um, but yeah I would say just generally treat tone as not something special but it's just uh, another phoneme that's equivalent to a vowel or a count uh, consonant. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah, tone is a very complex topic in phonology. Uh, it was hard to kind of fit it into this session, I think, but yeah. you did a great job given the basics there. Uh, let's see, we have a question. What role does orthography play in forensic linguistics and authorship analysis? I don't know if you know anything about this stuff, Eula. I really don't. Ooh, no, I don't want to say something that I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. If anyone yeah. here knows about forensic linguistics, feel free to speak up in the chat. I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We have another question. Is it true that vowels are nasal and consonants are oral? Hmm. <laughs> I mean... Uh, vowels can be nasal, but uh, vowels, like a lot of uh, languages, they have nasal vowels, right? And then they have regular vowels. Um, so I think vowels can be both um, in my, yeah, um, I'm just recalling all my <laughs> the, um, uh, um, linguistic class and in my experience, language uh, vowels can be uh, vocal or nasal, and consonants can also be vocal and nasal, so they can be all mixed, right? Totally. And I think if we go back to what you said about the difference between consonants and vowels, uh, Sani, for your question, uh, both airflow can both flow through your nose and your mouth, but it can also be stopped inside your nasal passages or inside your mouth. So you can have consonants that are stopped in your nose or your mouth, and you can also have vowels that flow through your nose and or your mouth. So yeah. consonants and vowels can be oral and nasal, both of them. Thank you, that's a more, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's an interesting question. Is there any reason why the vowel raising chart is slanted? Like why is it <laughs> shaped that way on the diagonal? Whoa, that's a really good question. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm not sure if I know the answer, but I'm assuming I'm just going to. I mean, as I as I was saying, like how it's uh, charted out, right? So you have front to back, you have close to open. So if you compare compare them, you have E and then the next level slanted going from close to close mid is E. So it's going 
open and back. So if you're going back, you have to be slanted um, because going back is going horizontal. Um, so that's uh, kind of the general. If you if it was going straight up and down, like the last row, which means there's no going back. <laughs> it's already you're at the back end. So this is kind of representing your uh, vocal structure. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, how, yeah. Uh, yeah. Nicely explained. Yeah, this the this chart is supposed to kind of represent the shape of our mouths in a way. So our mouths are not perfect squares, basically. Yeah. Uh, oh, here's a very flattering question for you, Eula. How did you get rid of your accent from your first language? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because I have a lot of first language. I have my mother tongue, Trostyav, and then I grew up speaking Tibetan, which is also actually really different from my mother tongue, and um, Mandarin. So I uh, grew up speaking these three languages pretty much, um, different domains of use. But uh, um, I think one biggest contribution of me not having such of a strong accent, even at the very beginning, was uh, having my uh, mother tongue has a lot of difficult sounds. Uh, so I think that helped me to exercise my vocal muscles. So they're more flexible uh, in terms of just uttering sounds. Uh, but I hate when Chinese tell me they're like, Oh, for Tibetans, it's so easy to learn English. You guys don't even have an accent. I'm like, no, I worked as hard as you are to learn English. But uh, <laughs> there's a the level of uh, when you when you utter a sound, uh, if your vo vocal muscle is exercised strong enough, you can kind of have minimal accent um, when you uh, learn a second language. I think that's my take on that. Um, so speak more languages and you will <laughs> you'll get rid of your, if that's your goal. I do like ha having accents though. <laughs> <laughs> that's great advice for everybody. Learn more languages if you can. Yeah. Uh, and then we have one last question that may be a little bit big for the end of this session. Uh, are there ways to document tones? And I feel like that's maybe a good question for a mentoring session to go really deep into how to document tones. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to drop a link in the chat to where anybody can sign up for a free appointment with any of the ELP language revitalization mentors make an appointment to talk anytime. Uh, we'd all love to talk with you uh, about whatever you are doing in your life. And then Eula, if people have questions about this week's session, can they email you? Absolutely, yeah. And yeah, email, whatever works. If you wanna schedule an appointment, talk about whatever things related to language or not. Um, if you wanna chat about your concerns or your um, struggles or your if you want to celebrate your achievement feel free to yeah schedule an appointment and uh, I'll be yeah available to talk awesome and I will just also put your email in the chat if people have questions can they email you for sure yeah awesome all right, everybody. Thanks for staying a little bit late today, but everyone had such interesting questions. So thank you, Eula, for a fabulous session on phonology and orthography. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, yeah, uh, dying for 5 a.m., 5.30 a.m. time zones. It's a dedication, and hopefully you got something out of it. And yeah, please stay connected. And uh, yeah, this uh, language work, we need to just communicate and uh, share resources, share knowledge. So I'm ha more than happy to share whatever I know and listen to whatever uh, yeah, you want to share. All right, thanks everybody. We will see you next week at this same time. Take care of yourselves and see you then. Sounds good. Bye-bye.
Have a nice weekend.